Today we are going to look more closely at the work of Soren Kierkegaard, the 19th century father of existential thought. And we saw last time in our general introduction to existentialism that there are some basic tenets of this way of thinking. One of which really arises from the work of Immanuel Kant. Now, although we didn't focus on Kant's metaphysical writing, we did see that in the final section of Kant's groundwork, he raises the problem that since the categorical imperative is possible on the basis of human freedom, and yet because I cannot prove nor disprove the existence of human freedom, it seems that I cannot prove that a categorical imperative actually exists. Okay? Now, of course, Kant overcomes this problem by simply saying that we can understand the self under two aspects as belonging to nature, but also to intelligence, but also that from a practical stance, a being that is faced with decision making on a daily basis, can only proceed on the assumption that one is free, okay? But what Kant teaches us in the Critique of Pure Reason is that certain ideas, like the idea of God, the idea of soul, and the idea of freedom, are what he calls transcendental ideas. We cannot prove that any of these ideas have exemplars in the world. I can neither prove nor disprove that God, freedom, or soul actually exist because they transcend the realm of human understanding. Okay? Now, certainly, Freedom, soul, and God have traditionally stood as fundamental grounds for the establishment of meaning. Unless we are free, then the question of the meaning of life cannot even be raised <clears throat> intelligibly. Because if I am not free to choose my own path, then what does it mean to say that what I do matters? And certainly, in the absence of a proof for the existence of God, that avenue toward establishing the meaning of life in terms of a divine plan is closed off to us. And in the absence of a proof for the existence of soul, then we are tempted toward materialism or the view that everything is just matter. There is no spiritual realm. When you die, it's over with. And so what ultimately can we say really matters. So this is why I personally find the, the seeds for existential thought in the work of Kant, although nobody would call Kant an existentialist. Okay? The basic tenets of existentialism are the following. For one thing, one cannot escape human subjectivity, which means that 
I cannot step outside of the structures of my own consciousness in order to have a direct confrontation with things as they are in themselves. And the most devastating result of this condition of being trapped within my own consciousness is what we call solipsism. Okay? And because I cannot get outside of my own shoes, I can't step outside of myself. The structures of human reason, my personal history, the structure of the language I speak, or even my moods, then it is impossible for me to establish the existence of an overarching meaning of human existence. Okay? And so, another basic tenet of existential thought is that there is no pre-existing essence of human existence. <clears throat> And so the question about human nature, what is human nature really, does not admit of an answer because we don't have a fixed nature. We are nothing but what we make of ourselves. First, we find ourselves existing. And in the course of that existence, we choose a path and we forge a meaning for our lives. Okay? And so, existentialism, in a word, comes down to decision. We are decision makers. And as even Socrates had argued, what is more important even than the particular decisions we make on a daily basis is the decision we make about what we ought to do with our lives at all. Not what ought I to do in this or that situation, but what is expected of me as a human being. And if nothing is expected of me as a human being, then where do I begin to make such a decision about what to do with my life? Okay. So Kierkegaard in recognizing that there is no escape from my own subjectivity, argues that there is a more meaningful sense of truth than the traditional modernist idea that truth simply means the correspondence between what I think the world is like and the way the world really is. We call that the correspondence theory of truth. If I say the lights are on, what makes my proposition true is the fact that the lights are on. Okay? But of course, even if I'm right about that, so what? That doesn't tell me what it means to be a human being. It doesn't even tell me whether the lights ought to be on.
And so what we call correspondence or propositional truth is not ultimately meaningful when it comes to making the decision about what to do with my life or what justifies human existence itself. Because certainly, just as each era or period in philosophy arises from a basic question, and what I mean by that is, for example, Plato said that philosophy begins in wonder. We wonder about things and therefore we ask questions. Aristotle similarly says that we have a pure desire to know things and so we inquire. In the modern period of philosophy, the 17th century, the impetus for questioning is doubt with the advent of science. We seek to understand what the world is really like, but we have cause for doubting our interpretation of reality, and therefore philosophy arises from the disposition of doubt. But in the postmodern, world to which Kierkegaard belongs, or at least initiates, a world in which the traditional questions regarding the existence of God, or the afterlife, or the soul, have all but been given up on. The impetus or origin of philosophical questioning becomes anxiety, angst, horror, terror, the horrifying notion that all our suffering, our effort, <clears throat> ultimately amounts to nothing, and that there is no justification for living a life about which we care, but which in itself amounts to nothing. And so existential thought is really born of the, the threat of nihilism, that life means nothing. And therefore, what is at issue is everything. Why live at all? And so Kierkegaard tells us that he has reached a point in his life where he realizes that the only question that matters is whether he can discover something worth living for or perhaps even worth dying for. And this, according to Kierkegaard, is a question that cannot be approached from the perspective of objectivity. So what do we mean by objectivity? Essentially, we mean science. When we put on a lab coat and step into the laboratory, Ideally, we leave our personalities at the door and we approach the subject matter 
with pure disinterestedness. I may have an interest in the outcome, but I cannot let that interest influence my findings. Rather, the question of the meaning of being, especially of being human, can only be approached from the subjective point of view. And that is why this particular reading that I've asked you to consider is called Subjectivity is Truth. What he's essentially arguing here is that there is a more meaningful sense of truth in subjectivity than there is in objectivity. Even if I could discover the answers to every scientific question that faces us, that still does not tell me whether or not life is worth living. Okay? And so what he does in this subjectivity is truth is to distinguish between two approaches to truth. The objective scientific approach and the subjective existential approach such that he concludes that subjectivity is true. And here truth does not mean propositional truth or the truth of the judgments I make about the world. Rather, truth is most meaningful as it is appropriated. Meaning, what do I do with that which I regard to be true? How do I take my understanding of the world and make it the basis for living a meaningful life. And so near the beginning of this selection, he says that if we are objective inquirers, the question pertaining to Christianity, and he speaks of Christianity because he himself becomes a Christian, okay. is not whether Christianity is true as a matter of historical fact, because that is not something I could ever prove, but rather, what is my relationship to Christianity? In other words, whether it is true or not that there was a man named Jesus who was the Christ, who was the Son of God sent to erase the mark of original sin and open the gates of heaven. But rather, what must I do as an individual existing in time in order to participate in the happiness, the joy, the salvation even, promised by Christianity? And if you think about it, there are only two possibilities. Either Christianity is true or it isn't true. If it isn't true, I've lost nothing 
by being a Christian. In fact, I have gained a world view in terms of which to understand my suffering. I have found something to ground me, to get me through life. But if it is true, well then of course, presumably I will reap the benefits of having become Christian. But of course, existentialism is not about what happens after life. It is about life itself and how I ought to live it and whether it means anything whatsoever. Okay. Or is it in the words of Macbeth, a tale told by a fool, full of pomp and fury, signifying nothing. Is all our suffering, all our anxiety, our exertion of emotion, energy, wit in vain does anything we do actually matter and what existentialism is about is finding something to live for and the point is that whatever it is that you find to justify your life is a matter of decision making. You choose your own meaning. We make it. You are nothing but what you do. What you hope to be, even what you think that you have become is nothing. The only reality is what you do. You are the sum of your actions and nothing more. Now it surprises people that there are Christian existentialists because in the 20th century Existentialism gained momentum, especially in France, as an atheistic doctrine. Given that God does not exist, where does that leave us? What other possible ground is there for living a meaningful life? And the answer is freedom. Your free decision. And it doesn't really matter what you decide to do. It doesn't matter if you make Kierkegaard's leap of faith toward Christianity or if you leap into Buddhism or Taoism or Hinduism, or Islam, or even something non-religious like the world of art, or theater, or music, or sports, or medicine. The point is that you find something about which you can generate enough passion to get you through. And so interestingly, unlike an objective approach to truth, wherein we ask, is X true? 
as a matter of fact, in which we seek, as Descartes put it, absolute certainty about the world. And in the course of which we have the academic luxury of remaining prudent and indecisive until we clearly understand what we're talking about. Until the evidence is in. Because if the evidence is still outstanding, I don't have to say yes or no. I don't have to publish a paper taking a side. I can just as well say this question cannot at present be answered. And here's why. And that is perhaps a noble thing for an academic to say. Rather, for Kierkegaard, what is more important is my ability to make a decision in the face of uncertainty. And in fact, perhaps paradoxically, I can only make a decision in the face of uncertainty. Perhaps, if I am free to make decisions and nothing is certain, then all decisions are made in the face of uncertainty. And I appreciate that comment. What Kierkegaard has in mind is this. Some things are arguably certain. Okay, sure. Like a mathematical proposition. If I say that A is greater than B, then certainly it follows that B is less than A. Okay? The whole is always greater than the part. Two, two points always describe a line. But so what? That doesn't tell me how I ought to live my life. Okay? Furthermore, if you tell me something like this, if you say all A are B, and all B are C, what can I conclude? All A's are C's, right? If all men are mortal, and all mortals will die, it follows that all men will die. Okay? And that is absolutely certain. It's a valid deductive argument. But if you accept these two premises, you don't have a choice about accepting the conclusion. Reason is compelled to accept it. If you tell me that A is equal to B and B is equal to C, and I accept that, then I am not free either to affirm or deny that A is equal to C. I am compelled to accept that A is equal to C. Therefore, the things about which I can be absolutely certain do not allow me to make a free decision. So paradoxically, decision-making in the authentic sense of really having to choose requires uncertainty. Decision presupposes uncertainty. Okay? 
only where I am uncertain must I make a real decision. And only where I make a real decision can I be passionate. I can't be passionate about A is equal to A. Okay? Now why am I passionate about the things that I decide? Precisely because I'm taking a risk. Why do political and religious discussions get heated so quickly? Because the subject matter is both the basis for my self-understanding and also something that I cannot prove. So people are very protective of the decisions they make in the political or spiritual domain. But to continue only where passion exists can there be faith. Faith requires passion, but passion requires making a decision, and decision requires uncertainty. Okay? And so, when reason despairs of its own inability to prove what is ultimately true, as Kant puts it, when reason enters the dialectics or antinomies of pure reason, all it can do is sort of stand back and watch itself struggle. Because I can give equally compelling arguments that the world must have a beginning and that the world cannot have a beginning. When it comes to these transcendental issues, reason is indecisive. And so I must make a decision from my freedom. And that is risky. But the risk is not that I might be wrong, because I, can, I cannot prove the existence of God or the non-existence of God. The reason existential decision is risky is because I must be able to generate enough passion to sustain my belief all the way to the end. It doesn't matter what I choose to believe. What matters is that I choose and take responsibility for having made the choice. Okay? This always reminds me of Leo Tolstoy's novella, The Death of Ivan Ilyich. Okay? It's a very short novel in which the protagonist, Ivan, has led his life according to the dual gods or idols of pleasure and propriety. He wants to live a life of pleasure, the good life, but part of living the good life is doing what is deemed proper by the crowd to which he 
seeks to belong. And so he led his life making decisions according to what other people deemed appropriate. He married just the right woman. He landed just the right job. He lived in the right neighborhood. He decorated his apartment in the right style. And then one day, as he was standing on a ladder fixing a curtain, he fell. And whether the fall was the cause, he shortly thereafter became ill. He had a problem with his cecum, or a kidney. And this ultimately became the cause of his death, okay? But during the last three days of his life, he holed up in his study with only the company of his assistant, a, a, a younger man. And he screamed at the top of his lungs for three days straight screaming that he had missed it. He missed the boat. He got it wrong. He led his life according to other people's ideals. He fought other people's battles. It wasn't the real thing. It was all a farce. It was all empty. But then on the very last day of his life, in fact, the last moments of his life, he had an epiphany. He realized that he could make it all right. He says, wait a minute, I can still make it all right. I can be delivered from this agony. And of course, he's not talking about simply dying. Now, of course, he can't go back and relive his life. And this is not a matter, a matter of apologizing to others because what is tormenting him is that his own life has been a waste. And Tolstoy doesn't tell us what this epiphany is. So we are led to speculate. Now, I personally think that what Ivan Ilyich realizes in these last moments is something very simple, that he himself made the decision to live this life. Simply taking responsibility for having made a decision and sticking to it, even if it is the wrong decision by somebody, by some standard, what he retains is the dignity of a free being. He freely chose to live this life. He alone is responsible for it. And so even in his last moments, he recognizes that he has a dignity which, as Kant would say, is inviolable. He took responsibility for his life and was thereby saved. Okay? Now, of course, that is just my excursion into the philosophy of literature, which is something I enjoy doing. As we saw in the Ethics of Care, which we will be quizzed on eventually. Um, excuse me, not in the ethics of care, in virtue ethics. One of the advantages of virtue ethics is that we can learn virtue not just by watching people around us, but by epic heroes, by literature and film, right? 
and literature, especially great literature, Russian literature, is replete with the existential struggle. Life is not easy. And it has nothing to do ultimately with simply putting food on the table. Anybody with any kind of drive whatsoever can put food on the table. The real challenge of living is finding something to live for. Something to justify suffering. Because it is not, as Viktor Frankl says, that people are unwilling to suffer. We are simply unwilling to suffer meaninglessly. But give a person a what to live for, one can live with almost any how. And this is how he explains those who were able to survive the death camps at Auschwitz and Dachau and others. So remember what Kierkegaard has established here. Existentialism does not mean atheism, although there are atheistic existentialists, as we will see. The point is not what you believe. The point is that what you are is what you choose to be. Life is a decision, and decision is only possible when we are uncertain. And therein lies the risk. There is a certain horror about existential awakening. Like, as it is portrayed in the famous painting, The Scream. That empty, nude horror. When you talk about existentialism, you get the, uh, you get the imagery of our simply spinning on this rock hurtling through space, attached to nothing, on our own. And existentialists deal in terminology like abandonment. We have been abandoned by the idea that someone or something can come along to save me. or despair. Despair meaning the realization that what my life can be is limited to the sum total of possibilities that are feasible for me. And anguish, which means that we alone decide our being. No one else can decide for me. I may knock on many doors looking for the answer. I can consult a preacher or a priest, a teacher, a psychologist, a friend, a mentor, a role model, but ultimately not only do I decide whose door to knock on, I decide whose advice to take. And I will continue to search until I find the answer which will work for me. And that's what existentialism is about. 
It is about taking back the right and the responsibility for choosing what it means to be human. No one has a monopoly on the meaning of human existence. No one in the history of the world has been more human than you or I am. Some have made bigger splashes. I will never be an Einstein. The name Brzezinski will never be uttered in the same sentence with Shakespeare or Mozart or Plato. But that does not mean that they were more human. It just means that they were geniuses. So perhaps you can go back to this selection, subjectivity is true, with the advantage of having talked about it, and realize that although he does not explicitly list the objective traits of inquiry versus the subjective, but that is essentially what he is doing. He is arguing that truth is more meaningful on the side of subjectivity, truth as we appropriate it. Because when reason despairs of its own dialectical difficulty, and by that I mean when you realize that there simply is no proof for what you ultimately believe, whether that is in the existence of a god or something else, then you also realize that what your life is going to be is completely up to you. The weight of existence rests entirely on your individual shoulders. Nobody can save you but you. And so Kierkegaard argues that we ought to make a leap of faith. There's no shame in it. Because ultimately, even objective scientific inquiry is human science. We understand things in a human way. We never have access to the way the universe is as a thing in itself. We understand things as human beings are able to understand them. It's all guesswork. The one thing that we really do have control over is our decision-making and what we decide is worth living for. So, from an ethical point of view, where does this leave us? If there is no human nature, but rather we choose our own essence, There may be a universality of human condition. We are all in the same boat in the sense of having to make a decision. We are fated to our freedom. You can't avoid it. But the meaning of life is not universal. It means only what you allow it to mean, and that amounts to what you do with it. So Kierkegaard is the first existential thinker, because existentialism 
is about decision-making. And so he is developing a doctrine of fideism. Okay? Or a doctrine about faith. How is it possible to develop faith? Because knowledge can't get us there. No matter what you know, it cannot make your life worth living. It is what you do that makes life worth living. And so he urges us to make the leap. Make a leap of faith. Make a decision to believe. And it doesn't matter what it is that you believe. What matters is that you have chosen to make a choice. <clears throat> that you have found passion. And so for Kierkegaard, the highest possibility for a, a being that exists in time, for mortal beings, is not knowledge, it's passion. The greatest thing you can experience is genuine passion. Even if it is for nothing but the pure flame of life itself, as Camus will later say. Okay? So fine. As we progress now and look at Nietzsche, Sartre, Camus, who is not really an existentialist, but a nihilist, we will come to understand Kierkegaard better. But what I want you to realize is that a shift has taken place here. We are now no longer asking what is the meaning of goodness? What does it mean to live a good life? We are asking how is it possible to find meaning in a life that means nothing in itself. Not only are we responsible for what we do, we are also responsible for deciding what is worth doing. There is no correct moral theory because this is no longer about correctness. This is about the quality of your life. Okay. So, I will post a quiz over the weekend over Kant. And of course, stay with the reading assignment on the calendar which I believe calls for Nietzsche on Monday, unless I'm mistaken. Yes. Um, two questions. When is the quiz going to do? Um, I have to write it. After I write it, well, you know, I, I won't make it due until probably Tuesday. At 11.59 p.m. No, so you'll be fine. Even if you don't look until Monday, you'll be fine. Okay. All right, guys. Um, I don't know. Our final is just from the material we 